Good morning and welcome to this beautiful Tuesday, December morning. Uh, my name is Christopher Brown, the host of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. And today I am honored, it is my pleasure, and I'm actually kind of starstruck that I had, I am having the pleasure to sit down with uh, a hero of mine. Uh, I watched his show, Mike Duffy Live, Countdown with Mike Duffy as a child, and also in my time in journalism school. Uh, retired Senator Mike Duffy, thank you so much for being here. It is an honor and a pleasure to do this. Chris, it's a delight to be on with you, and uh, it's a delight to be part of someone who is the next generation, the next phase of journalism in Canada. It's, uh, it's my pleasure. Well, thank you. Let's talk about that for a second. Journalism in Canada. You have had an extensive career in journalism, starting back in Prince Edward Island, and I was uh, with the Charlottetown Guardian to the Halls of Power in Ottawa. Looking back on your career, I, I, you, you would not see that in today's society. Journalism does not happen as it did when you were a, a kid and becoming the person who you are today. How has journalism well, changed since you have been around? Well, I started out uh, writing for the uh, Charlottetown newspaper uh, on weekends, high school news and record reviews. This was as a freelancer being unpaid. And uh, I was into music. I was into, uh, I, I was really dazzled by the magic of radio. Uh, this is before, t uh, we're talking the 60s, the early 60s. And TV was just, had just been around in Canada uh, for fewer than 10 years. And uh, it, was, it was a bit different. But as a kid in grade school, I was invited to be part of a kind of reach for the top show that was on uh, local radio uh, every week. And a bunch of school kids went to the radio studio and there were two teams from two schools and we did the usual reach for the top thing. And we were in a studio that had been used by Don Messer and his Islanders, which was a musical band uh, that broadcast from Charlottetown all across the CBC network. And so as a kid growing up in those days before TV, you would sit in the evenings or after school or whatever and look at the radio as if it was the TV, because you had no TV. And then this magical stuff would come across the radio, including Don Messer, who was actually a few blocks away downtown with his orchestra playing. And here it was being heard all over the country, all over Canada. And so finally here as a kid in grade five or six or something, we're in this studio, there are boom mics hanging, and uh, the walls weren't straight because they had deliberately put curves in to reduce echo and all of those things that they did. And you would see if you went back and looked at a, an old fashioned a studio in, in the old movies. And here it was. And I said, man, this is magic. It comes from this room. And here I am with my gang from school and we're in this same room and we're broadcasting uh, to all of Prince Edward Island. It was quite a remarkable uh, feeling. And it was the magic of radio. And then as I got older, uh, I got interested in media. And uh, we had a weekly in 1962, a weekly TV show called Club 62, which again, was kind of crazy because the uh, woman who was the producer got the kids together from the local high schools and we had our you know this is your show so you'll plan it out and whatever and we had to pick a name and we couldn't think of a name and so somebody said well what about it's 1962 let's call it club 62 and we did that and the station made a little animated opening on a film camera with the music playing and pictures of us bouncing around on the screen. But then we got to January 63 and we were still Club 62. And then we had a second season and we're 63, 64. <laughs> so so uh, 
you know, advanced planning. Oh, what about the name? So, but that again got me interested and provided me with some focus. And I spent more time on getting ready for this weekly TV show and writing my weekly column for the newspaper about high school news. And I did that and didn't study. And so um, that's how I, I got it in my blood. Then one day I'm in French class and my teacher uh, gets a message and he calls me out and I think, what's going on? And so we go out into the hall. He says, I've just had a message from the radio station in Halifax. He was a stringer for CHNS radio in Halifax. And they called him at the high school and said, we want you to go down and cover a story. He says, I can't uh, go down and cover this breaking news story because I'm a teacher, I mean, I've got classes, I can't just walk out and leave them. And they said, well, we have to cover this. There's a ship, an oil tanker burning in Charlottetown Harbor and they've evacuated downtown Charlottetown. So here I am, Mr. Club 62, Mr. Weekend Newspaper columnist. And uh, he called me, Duffy, get out here. He says, there's a ship burning in the harbor go down and here's the phone number for the radio station in Halifax. So I go down and there's one or two reporters and the police chief and the fire chief all standing in a knot. And I run up and say, what's going on? And uh, start taking notes. And th they were briefing the local media. And I went into an empty, they had emptied the waterfront and there was a potato warehouse right over there. And I went in and there was a phone on the desk and I dialed zero and said, I want to make a collect call. And the guy says, look out the door. Can you see the ship? Yeah, it's just like a hundred yards away. What do you see? And so I start describing to him what I see and I don't even think about it, but he's recording me uh, on, on the phone, giving wow. a description of this oil tanker. So uh, it was a small little coastal oil tanker, Irving, the Sea Conch. And I thought, wow, this is better than school. We're down here where it's happening. And unlike those hundreds of people who are back up two blocks away behind the police lines, you're a journalist, so you've got a front row seat. So then um, they towed the ship out into the harbor and beached it on a sandbar so that it could burn away from a populated area, just burn itself out. And so CHNS said to me, where's the captain? I said, well, they all got off the ship um, and went down to the Queen Hotel and they're having lunch, I think. Go down to the Queen Hotel. So I go down, is there a phone in the lobby? I said, yeah. And uh, so I go down to this local hotel that's no longer there. And he said, call me from the lobby. So I go in, get on the pay phone, call him back. He says, now leave the phone hanging, go into the dining room and tell the captain there's a long distance call for him in the lobby. And I go in and there's the captain. And I tell him, I don't tell him who it is. I just say, captain, there's a long distance call. He comes out, picks up the phone. They've got the tape rolling and they interview him. Captain, what happened to your ship? Blah, blah, blah. So CHNS had, had an interview. He wasn't giving interviews to the local media. But the oh. guy at CHNS said to me, people will interrupt anything to answer a long distance phone call. <laughs> and so now I say to myself, my God, they beat the locals who the captain just walked by. No, no, I'm not talking. And went to launch. And I thought, wow, this is better than almost anything else I can think of. And so uh, <laughs> that was when I, journalism was journalism. You, you, you like that. Well, the game was not uh, your right to cut to the chase. Uh, to me, the game was getting the story. Yeah to how do you, how, you know, and I was learning from the guy who was quarterbacking me in Halifax, uh, how you do it, how you get information and stuff that nobody else has, and you get to put it on the air. And that's what intrigued me, was that this was 
this was fun. This was interesting. This was a challenge. Um, I, I fear that in a lot of what I see today, people have a, a plan or an ideology or a something, and they want to use the media to straighten out the world. Well, that to me is not, it's not the way I grew up with journalism. Um, you assume that if you give the public all of the facts in the democracy, the public will make the right choices. And so I didn't come at it with an ideology or a particular point of view. I came at it with saying, what are the facts? And let the public decide. They're intelligent. And the people who they elected put themselves before the electorate and the electorate said, yay or nay. And um, so who am I? Who elected me? Nobody. I was hired by the editor to do a job, not to change the world. Now, that doesn't mean when you see something that's wrong, you shouldn't report it. But it's, it's putting the cart before the horse or whatever. We, I, 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 I mean, I usually. So from to... there, from there, I went full time at the Guardian and learned the basics of who, what, where, when, and why. And then I went and starved. Um, I was, I was, newspapering was fine but I wasn't a particularly talented writer. And so um, I thought, I want to get into broadcasting. This is the thing that I find so exciting, the immediacy of it. And in those days, we didn't have uh, mini cams and the kind of live capability in TV you have today. So I went into radio. Um, I went to Halifax. Um, I spent the summer of 64 managing a rock and roll band. The and Beavers? When the, the Beavers, <laughs> yes, indeed. And then they came back in the fall of 64 to uh, Halifax. And I worked um, washing dishes in a restaurant and reading the news on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday night on CJCH radio. And I got 15 bucks a shift. And the rent at the Y was $30 a month, $30 a week. And so I had no money for food. <laughs> Needless to say, I wasn't uh, overweight. And, um, but Olin's had a hockey team uh, staying at the Y in Halifax uh, in training camp. And there was always somebody from the team who didn't make the meal. And so um, I'd go in with the boys and today you're Joe Smith and tomorrow you're Harry Brown. And so I just signed, they had paid for so many meals. And so that's how I ate. And then I would go up the street and spend every waking hour at the radio station watching how they did it in Halifax, which was seen then as the big time. and. Um, I was terrible. Uh, I read the news in the weekends and uh, the rest of the time I hung around watching, learning, see how they did things. But um, anyway, at the end of three months, uh, they pulled me aside and said, listen, you're not cutting it on Saturday and Sunday night. You've got to go to a small town and practice, practice, practice. And so I didn't have a job. They drove me out to the end of the Bicentennial Highway, which is leading out of Halifax. And the, uh, a friend, not the management, a friend uh, handed me a $5 bill and said, good luck. And I was hitchhiking in my little suit and suitcase with my scrapbook from the newspaper, hitchhiking back home to PEI for Christmas of 64. And, um, the rides weren't very plentiful. And so I ended up in Truro on my way to the car ferry. So the deal was you need three bucks to get on the ferry. So I had $2 uh, a buck for a, a hamburger and a Coke. And um, 
Anyway, so I went to the police station in Truro and said, uh, I got nowhere to stay and I'm in my little outfit. And uh, can I spend the night in the jail? And the uh, officer uh, said, no, 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 no. We have a rec room upstairs. You can sleep on the sofa and there's a washroom up there. So I went up to the policeman's lounge and uh, dumped my stuff and took my clippings over to the radio station. It was the end of the day that people had left, most of them. But the DJ who was there said, hey, we've been looking for a guy to work at our station in Amherst, which is 100 miles down the road. Um, so we'll send your resume, uh, your clippings down there, which I did, which they did. And the next day I hitchhiked home to PEI. Uh, my parents picked me up at the ferry and I was back and my father said, you've got to get a job. You can't do this broadcasting thing. It's not, it's not working for you. And uh, I've investigated and in January, you're always interested in electronics. And in January, the local vocational school uh, has a course for electricians. And so uh, I've got you enrolled in this electrician's course. And I thought, well, that's very interesting, but um, I still have my dream, right? So uh, sure enough, a few days later, the manager of the radio station in Amherst calls me and I pitch myself to him. And he says, well, come on over. So my parents scraped up the money. We had no money scraped up the cash and I got a bus ticket to Amherst and from 15 bucks a shift in Halifax I was hired at $70 a week at CKDH in Amherst and that was it I worked 20 hours a day uh, I not that they asked me to I was just give me the opportunity and then I learned lesson number one for journalism which even though I'd seen some other stuff before, um, I learned a couple of things through all of that. One, I wasn't blessed with a deep voice. I wasn't particularly handsome, so nobody was talking about me for TV. But the first big thing was you had to have a set of pipes, and I didn't have the set of pipes. So how do you uh, compensate for that? What do you offer? if you don't offer the classic thing, well, one of them was hustle and two was the ability to get stories. So I tried to make up for my lack of a deep voice by making sure I hustled, understood what the bosses wanted and learned as much as I could watching others who were good at it and who worked at it. So who and, were some of those people? Uh, who were some of those people that you watched? Because that's, I always find it fascinating because I, I was, before this interview, I, I listed the people who I watched and you were one of them. Who were the people you watched? Well, in Halifax, uh, during my Saturday night, Sunday night time, there was a local radio reporter named Max Keeping, who later went on to fame in Ottawa as the anchor and news director at CJOH, the CTV station. But Max in the 60s had just come out of Newfoundland and he was wearing his beetle boots and his curly hair. And he was, uh, <laughs> he, was uh, he was a character, but he was very smart. And he um, taught me how to go early to events to cover three events at the same time. You go early to the first one and you explain your situation to the main actor and say, listen, I can't stay because I've got all these other things. Uh, so can you give me a quick burst on what you're doing now? And then you go to another event that is at the regular scheduled time. You leave it early and you have two microphones. You have a tape recorder and you have two microphones. And one, you're, you're taking the news conference at the appointed time, and then you pop your microphone out and grab your tape recorder and zip off to the next one and you use your tape recorder because you only have one recorder at the third event and then you go back later and pick up the mic from the second event so max was a master at uh, 
you know, uh, of this kind of stuff. And I just watched him like a sponge. And so he was my main instructor before Amherst. And then in Amherst, I practice and practice. And then uh, in 65, I got invited back. Oh, uh, in 65, at Christmas 65, I get a call from CKOY in Ottawa. And they're a 50,000 watt station. And Hal Anthony was the news director. And he calls me up and says, I hear that you're a hustler. And that's what I want and somebody to do the night shift in Ottawa. So he asked me to read him a piece of wire copy over the phone and says, you sound fine. Great. And so, and here again, for young people, the advice. Um, so I'm going to quit Amherst after a year and I'm going to go to Ottawa. And so I call my parents and say, I've had this offer for a hundred bucks a week in Ottawa. And my father says to me, don't ever leave a place that you can't go back. So when you leave, thank the people in Amherst, tell them you love them, tell them you appreciate all they've done for you. And uh, don't mouth off about you know, you guys are small time. I'm going to the big time. Just be polite and be courteous. And I said, okay, good idea. Just reinforce it. So I get in my little Volkswagen and I drive to Ottawa and I'm, I drive nonstop <laughs> and I get there. And of course, nobody knows who I am, which of course, uh, anyway, I'm there for two weeks and they come to me and say, you're not cutting it. You're not, you don't have the pipes. And Hal Anthony says, my advice to you, young man, is to go sell ties at Eaton's. You'll never make it in this business. And so I was heartbroken, but he, he said, we have phoned Amherst and told them you weren't ready. And they said, he's a good kid. Send him back. We haven't filled his job. We're happy to have him back. Thank you, Dad, for that bit of advice to keep your mouth shut and be polite. And so I went back, and six months later, I get called to Halifax to the other station in Halifax, CHNS. Just one final thing about being humble. When I finally, like I'm starving at CJCH the first time around when I'm doing Saturday and Sunday night, so finally, after a couple of weeks because of payroll, my first paycheck arrives and I'm desperate for money. And the news director was a guy named Robert McCleave, and he had been a conservative MP and was later a conservative MP and deputy speaker. But this, he was out of office and the manager of the station gave him a job to get him through the period. The owner of the station. And the goddamn paycheck comes and it's made out to Mike Gillis, not Mike Duffy. So here I am. Yeah. What's his name again? Mike. Yeah. 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 We'll just put uh, Gillis McLeave, on it. <laughs> McCleave was the, the original absent minded professor. Anyway, um, so here I've got this check. I have no, I have no cred. I have no nothing with anyone and I have to go down to the CBC and find Mike Gillis and get him to countersign the check so I can go to the bank and cash it now I suppose I could have forged his thing or you know whatever but anyway I go down and find Mike Gillis at the CBC and say you won't believe this but here's this paycheck so so anyway it teaches you to be humble and I am then I get to Halifax in 65, because I'm almost caught up to you. And I'm, I'm doing everything. I'm rolling discs on FM in the morning. And I'm uh, doing city hall and the legislature and everything that moves city council at night. And I'm just going day and night. And that's 65. And we go, I'm learning every day, and whatever. And eventually, they take me off the FM and just have me full time on the, on the news. Um, and then 67, Robert Stanfield's the premier of Nova Scotia 
And in 1967, he decides he's going to run for the leadership of the Progressive Conservative Party. And so their convention was in Toronto. So I said to the station, so Stanfield's your hometown boy. Uh, surely you're going to, who's going to Toronto? Oh, nobody. We're a network affiliate. We'll just take the feed from the network. We don't have to spend money on something as luxurious as this. And we had a deal at the station in those days where if you're, um, if, if you're a stringer in, in uh, Yarmouth or somewhere else, and you call in and did what we call in those days a voice report, we paid you five bucks. And I said, look, if we're paying five bucks for these people in the outports to call in stories, what if I go on my own to Toronto and uh, will you pay me $5? And they said, well, yeah, I guess so. Okay. If you're really that determined. So I go down to household finance because I had no money and I borrow 500 bucks. And 500 bucks got me to Toronto airfare and got me a week at the Westbury Hotel. And I've got my tape recorders and stuff. By now I've got two recorders so I can edit. And uh, anyway, so um, I went there and of course, Stanfield wins. So the, we were part of standard broadcasting, which was CFRB, all these people with these deep voices. And they had a briefing every day. And at the briefing, they would say, blah, blah, blah. So-and-so is gonna win Donald Fleming or whoever. And then the last person they called on was the kid from Halifax, yeah, what's Stanfield doing? And I said, well, Stanfield's people say, yada, 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 we're doing really well, and we've got this number of delegates, and we blah, 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 and uh, yeah, 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 he, he won't win. Uh, and then they'd carry on. And of course, Stanfield won. And all of a sudden, who's coming to the kid from Halifax with the big stars and CFRB where they had Gordon Sinclair and Betty Kennedy and all these people. And they're saying, can you get Stanfield to come on our radio show? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm the guy who, uh, who had no, no hope, right? Uh, Stanfield's a candidate with no hope, but now all of a sudden, instead of a zero, I'm a hero. And uh, can you get the interview? And of course I did. Uh, and But what it did to me was it energized me to understand that or, or to confirm that people get excited about things like sports, right? But at the end of the day, sports don't matter. It may, it may matter to you emotionally, but it doesn't change the country. It gives us something to cheer for or to hate like the Leafs or whatever. But politics is fun. It's the A team and the B team, the red team, the blue team, the green team, whatever, the orange team. And it's like the NHL playoffs. And at the end of the day, on, on a leadership, whoever wins shapes the course of history. Could be prime minister. Stanfield never was, of course. But all of that, and you have fun, and it's a contest. And, and it matters. And so that convinced me that covering politics was critically important. And one other thing from that time was in 65, there was a general election. And so I'm the boy reporter in Amherst, which is Cumberland County, Nova Scotia. And the MP was a guy named Bob Coates, who later became Brian Mulroney's Minister of National Defense. And so as the local reporter and the local MP, you got to know the MP uh, pretty well, or at least he knew who you were. So in 65, Diefenbaker, the legendary John Diefenbaker is canvassing or uh, campaigning in the Maritime on a train. He's tied onto the back of the Ocean Limited going from Montreal to Halifax. And so he's getting off in these various stops and, uh, and doing little mini rallies in all these small towns. And so he's coming to Amherst. So 
Bob Coates arranges for me to get on the train. He says, come to the big event in Truro on the train. I'll get you an interview with the chief, Mr. Diefenbaker, and um, I'll, you can drive back with me and some other people from Amherst, from Truro. Somebody will have a car and we'll all come back to you. Great. So I get on the train and Tom Van Dusen Sr. meets me. Now, for those who watch the media, the Van Dusens are legendary CPAC. in Ottawa. <laughs> CPAC uh, is Tom Van Dusen's son. Peter Van Dusen is Tom Van Dusen's son. And uh, Julie Van Dusen at CBC, just retired, was Tom Van Dusen's daughter. And he was a, Tom was a Tory, but he also worked later for the Liberals. He was a thoroughly decent, lovely man. Anyway, Tom Van Dusen uh, meets me at the door. Oh yeah, come on. And this is the press car, blah, blah, blah. And who's there? Max Keeping. He since left Halifax, went to Ottawa and was back on the 65 election campaign for an Ottawa radio station. So I come in there with my little tape recorder what are you doing? I said, well, I'm, I've got an interview with Mr. Diefenbaker. No, 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 no. He hasn't talked to the press for three days. He's not going to talk to you. I said, well, Bob Coates says he's arranged it. Oh, Coates is a Diefenbaker loyalist. He's a big pal of Diefs. Maybe he has. What are you going to ask? So here I am, boy reporter, 1965. I was not old enough to vote. And um, so what are you going to ask, Mr. Diefenbaker? Oh, I don't know. What are you going to do for Cumberland County? No, 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 no. That's not good enough. And so the whole gang got around a manual a portable typewriter, cranked in some copy paper, and wrote on behalf of the press gallery, who were traveling with them, all the questions that they wanted answered. So I go in with my typewritten sheet of questions, put the microphone in, and, uh, and that was actually quite a wow. scene because he's in the dining car, a private dining car with his team. And there are all these people sitting around this big mahogany table. Deef was there uh, with an open neck shirt and a sweater. And um, there was a guy sitting opposite him in a red velvet smoking jacket, steel gray hair, looked like something out of Hollywood and all these other people. So when I come out, I said, who's the guy in the red velvet smoking jacket? I said, man, that's pretty, uh... he says, oh, that's Canada's most decorated Canadian, General Richard Romer. And he was put on the train and Richard Romer's daughter, Ann Romer was on city TV in Toronto. And Richard Romer was a lawyer and a key advisor to Ontario Premier John Robarts. And Richard Romer um, was put on the train, and you read the history books later, by, uh, at the request of John Robarts, the Premier of Ontario, to crank stuff out for Mr. Diefenbaker to use in his speeches that would have special appeal to Ontario where the most people and the most votes are. So anyway, part of the trick of Richard Romer was uh, he was complaining that uh, Deef never uses my stuff. Well, he says, I, I got all kinds of people writing stuff for me. He says, I'll tell you what, um, you get some pink paper or some yellow paper and I'll know it's from you. And that way I'll be sure to use it. And so Romer gets off the train. This is in the book. You can look it up. Gets off the train in Quebec City, goes to a stationery store, buys a stack of pink paper or yellow paper, gets on the train, and you know what happens? That, that meant that under no circumstances, not even by accident, would Mr. Diefenbaker read a line rich, written by Richard Romer? Now he knows this came from that guy. No way, Jose. So anyway, um, so anyway, that was so. I I leave the 
the uh, press car, leave the dining car. And I've asked him all these questions. And of course, he's given me the Diefenbaker treatment, right? Ah, uh, Duffy, where are you from? And I said, Charlottetown. Oh, oh, uh, I used to know a guy named uh, Gavin Duffy. Uh, does that ring? I said, that was my grandfather. Terrible grit. He said, terrible grit. I knew him from the Bar Association. And uh, yeah, he was a member of the Canadian Bar and, and uh, president for PEI or whatever, and so on and so forth. And of course, I'm dazzled, right? I'm 20 years old and I'm thinking, my God, he knew my grandfather. And then I realize afterwards, although nobody ever told me, but it, it dawns on me that Bob Coates probably briefed him. This is the kid. Here's where he's from. His grandfather was the liberal speaker of the house in PEI and was a judge and whatever. And Deef comes in and gives me the old treatment and there it was. So I got a million Deef stories, which I won't bore you with, but so I, I come I, out of the, two final things. And this is about the reporter part. I come out of the thing, do the interview, read all the questions the others have smarter, wiser guys who've written for me, and it was all guys. And uh, as we're leaving the car, I see a guy in a white trench coat standing in between, in the vestibule between the cars as we're rattling along. And I said to Tom Van Dusen, I said, uh, is that a Mountie or a bodyguard or something? And he said, no, 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 that's Joe Blow from the New York Times. I said, the New York Times? I said, I did an interview. And the New York Times does, there are no votes for us in the New York Times. And that's, that's the whole thing, right? So if you're in local media as a young reporter somewhere, you matter because your writing matters to the political leader. And so make, Do you think the, it does, make the though? most of it. Do you think it does in today's age, though? Because... We, well, we just well, we certainly just went the New through... York Times because it's an American, uh, right? So uh, understandable, but I'm just looking at the last federal election and Trudeau, O'Toole, Singh, Anime Paul were not doing many local interviews. And back when you were a reporter, local mattered. Local was the thing. Now it's yeah. okay if I could just do an interview with CBC News National or CTV Live at night, then I, I've covered the whole nation. But local well, part is of still it's where it is. Not make, yes, I agree with you. And part of that is not making a mistake. Because if you open up to uh, the local media, they're going to ask about something that you perhaps don't know about, haven't been briefed on, your staff made a mistake. And therefore, the story of the day will be he doesn't know the most important issue facing Belleville or Cardston, Alberta, or wherever you are. So I think some of that has become defensive. And I, I would like to think that we're near the bottom of the pile and that we're going to start to come up. Uh, in terms of uh, local mattering. And I think the public's fed up with the gotcha stuff. I mean, yes. there's great glee in the media. Oh, we got him, or he, you know, he stumbled, or this or that. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that the public wants to be treated with respect, and I think they get tired of talking points. <laughs> Journalism is in crisis, and our mission here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast is to tell the story that isn't being told. It is vital that independent journalism survives with the rise of fake news. Every penny that is contributed to the Cross Border Interview Podcast goes to help continue our work to tell people's stories. All of our content is produced and edited by our team. The Cross Border Interview Podcast provides entirely free content, and we will never 
hide stories behind paywalls. By supporting a new model of journalism, our listeners, like you, are supporting real, independent journalism. Consider making a monthly donation via our Patreon account, or make a one-time donation by Interact eTransfer. Now, let's get back to the show. Speaking of gotcha journalism, we, we I have to ask the question about the gotcha journalism that went after you in uh, as after you were appointed to the Senate in 2012. Um, you became the sort of the poster child of guilty until proven innocent in the media. People threw nasty things at you because of an expense claim. And the media ran rampant with, you are guilty by association and we will not hold you innocent until the courts tell you. And in our society, we are innocent until proven guilty. But the media, at the rise in 2012 with the, the guilty until proven innocent metaphor has become the new narrative of the mainstream media. When that was happening, you were a former journalist. You, you, you took honor and pride to cover politics the way it should have been done. When you were seeing what was happening, what did you think about journalism in that day of age? Well, I thought there was a lot of... Uh, a lot of hypocrisy and a lot of uh, people... I, I, to say I was disappointed, I guess, is an understatement. But I told my whole story. I was supposed. I was told by my lawyer, "You cannot speak publicly, because you have an audience of one, and the one is the judge. And so, uh, don't tell your story to the public." But I did tell my story to Dan Leger, who totally ignored it, and then wrote a book about how much time I spent at the press club bar, where he also was. And I told Mansbridge and his pal, uh, Bruce Anderson, for hours, like three hours, I went through every, every single thing. This is before the trial. And I said, look, I've got a ton of emails. Um, you know, I did not do anything wrong. I did not break the rules. I did not um, uh, whatever. And I've got a ton of emails to prove it. I was, I was extorted by Harper and his gang to do this. It was crazy. I mean, it, it showed in a way how weak Harper was. He wouldn't stand up and say, Duffy didn't break the rules, bugger off. I mean, he, there was a simple answer. But Harper's one of these guys who thinks he's so smart that he's sinking four or five steps ahead. Well, he thought himself right out of office. And the conservatives have been out ever since. But um, what was disappointing was that in the face of the mob, people who knew me very, very well, like Peter Mansbridge, uh, ignored all of that and didn't speak up. And part of that is self-preservation because he didn't want the mob inside the CBC to turn on him. Look what they did to Wendy Mesley. They drove her out. And so Peter knew that. And so Peter is the ultimate political player, decided my friend Duffy for 30 years, what, 20 years, whatever, we've been friends. And uh, like I covered for him uh, in, in so many ways, not just covering news stories, but okay. you know, whenever anybody, <laughs> whenever anybody had an evening out, oh, I was out with Duff, we were drinking. So that was, a, I'd go to the Christmas party and all the wives are looking at me like I'm an animal uh, because I was used by so many husbands as an excuse to, uh, oh, I was out with Duff. So, uh, so that was the disappointing part. And uh, did, and, did it and show Peter journalism? has a lot to answer for in terms of where the CBC is now, because he facilitated that. He could have said no, not just in relation to me, but in relation to everything else that has happened. Uh, and he was the most powerful person there, uh, even though he was technically an announcer, 
but uh, no, no, no. What so, about yeah. Lloyd Robertson? Was Lloyd ever in your corner as well? Because you were on CTV, you were Mike Duffy live Lloyd, with CTV. Did, did Lloyd and you have yeah. a good relationship? Well, you got to remember that there were other people who didn't want me at CTV, primarily Craig Oliver. And uh, I won't bother going into that. It's not worth So Lloyd depended every day on Craig, right? Okay. Um, uh, Jack Webster and Bruce Phillips both said to me, um, it, was, it was Bruce Phillips, not Jack Webster, uh, who said, uh, when you're going to do a live broadcast, the host, uh, I don't want to get in a slangy match at Lloyd. Lloyd was having Craig whisper in his ear okay. about what a terrible person I was. And that was from day one. And don't forget, we'd been arch competitors. Uh, and then I go over to CTV and he didn't bury the hatchet. And it's the same way that Peter treated Pam. Pam had been at CTV, arch competitor. CBC brought Pam over for this primetime news thing. And she lasted a year or something and then was driven out. So no, there are rivalries and, uh, and there are people with agendas and people who constantly work behind the scenes to uh, bring the others down. I never had the luxury of that kind of scheming because I, the only way I could survive uh, because I wasn't handsome and didn't have any voice and all that stuff was to work, to know stuff before anybody else. And so, um, so I was busy hustling. Uh, I, I rarely went to the office. There are no stories in the newsroom. The stories are all on Parliament Hill. Yeah. So, uh, you know, whether it's coffee in the fifth floor cafeteria or whatever, and you just bump into people and people are retiring. I got stories about Trudeau and Margaret from, Jean Marchand, uh, who was leaving the Senate and talked about the first time uh, he met Margaret with Pierre and how passionate Pierre was and madly in love with her and wouldn't consider, or, you know, if anybody said anything negative, he got quite angry. So, no, no, uh, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't spend a lot of time in, in the office politics. I thought I've got a job to do over here. And I was dumb enough to think that the bosses see the output, the bosses see what's going on, and they'll recognize the rest of it for just carping and backstabbing. You, in 2016, you were vindicated. The uh, Superior Court judge announced that you were vindicated of all uh, 31 charges, if I'm not mistaken. Did you get apologies from the people who had covered the story so negatively? Because that's what I want. <laughs> and I know that's a stupid question to ask, but I got to ask because I would want an apology from some of the reporters and some of the stuff that they said about you. I would want an apology. Have they apologized? And I'm thinking like no, Robert no. Fife. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, at least uh, we can laugh about it now, right? Well, um, you know, all of this stuff hurts, right? Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, uh, and my wife is, I mean, I shouldn't say it didn't hurt me, but I was able somehow in my head to divorce myself from that. And part of it was to focus on the judge and you know, not to be smarmy, not to be catty, not to be haughty, just be humble, go in and tell your story, just to just tell the truth. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, so so the rest of it doesn't matter. And where are they now? Yeah. And, you know, uh, karma is a bitch, you know, people who, uh, you know, it's, you know, the other thing is, is part of what happened to me, I think, was the result of trying to stand up and keep politics out of the newsroom. We had 
the C CTV had a system where um, I'm going too long for you. Um, I love CTV it though, so system, I do apologize, kind of, but I, I have a few other questions, but I, I, I love this conversation a, right a now. A kind of, uh, CTV had a farm system. You start out, you come out of J school, you go to work in the newsroom in Toronto. Then if you show some promise, they put you on Canada AM. In other words, you work all night writing stories and intros and stuff for Canada AM. And if you do that for a year or so and show up on time and are reliable and so on, it's a kind of a testing period. Then um, they look at you as a field producer and they put you out with a reporter to help the reporter do their job. And some come to Ottawa as chase producers for the five o'clock show, Evan Solomon show and or question period, which they now tape on Friday, which. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm a big believer in live news, you know, or semi live, i.e. same day anyway. Um, but the, it's through that system that you get people who work on your show. So my routine was I'd wake up in the middle of the night, seven o'clock, so 6.30, 7 a.m. I check all the papers, what's going on since I went to bed. And then I would write a quick memo to my senior producer and say, here's what I see today. Boom, boom, boom. And we leave this in this blank and say a prayer to the God of breaking news that there'll be something exciting happen that we can make the lead. And then at 10 o'clock, we would have a conference call. And so uh, on this conference uh, call, we discuss what we were chasing and doing. And what I discovered was that one young woman, well, Jack Layton's doing this and Jack Layton's doing that. And every day it was Jack, Jack, Jack. I said, hold on. I said, we need 100,000 viewers a day for this show to, and this has been my philosophy. It wasn't just in response to her, but it was the whole reason for raison d'etre of the show, which is you got to have a, a number that's sustainable that'll cover your costs. And we figured that was 100,000. So if you look at Canadian popular vote, 40% vote liberal, 40% or 35% vote Tory, and the remainder vote uh, to around 20%, vote for the NDP, maybe 22, whatever, and then the fringes. So it seems to me that if you're gonna get an audience of 100,000, what you want is as many people as possible from all different points of view. We're a small country. You know, in the States, MSNBC can be on the left and Fox can be on the right and they can each get manageable numbers and CNN can somehow try and skate in the middle and, and get decent numbers as well. But in Canada, the population isn't that big for political shows. So you got to make sure that the liberals are watching, the Tories are watching, the dippers are watching. And the only way you can do that is to provide a fair amount of time for everybody, but not to be dominated by the NDP, which is a minor party, minority party um, in, in Canadian political life. And so I'd explain this, and then I was the bad guy. And after two years, because, oh, well, I said, listen, the NDP will get their time. But unless they're a critical vote on a major issue, that's not where people are. The issue today is whatever. And they'll get a say, but they won't be the show. Anyway, two years later, a young woman says to me, I'm leaving. I said, oh, sorry to hear that. Where are you going? I'm going to work for Jack. And I said, great, enjoy yourself. Don't forget your old pals. Call Toronto and say, she's leaving. She's going to work for Jack. Don't send me any more of these hyper-partisan people. Send me somebody who understands what we're trying to achieve here, which is to maximize the numbers and be fair to everybody. And the president of CTV says to me, we're an open port. We want to have all comers. We don't want this stuff. Yes, yes, yes. 
I said, uh, so no more of this uh, stuff. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Don't worry. We'll all look after you. Next one comes down. Her name is Kathleen Monk. She stays two years. Same thing. Jack, 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 Jack. She goes to work for Jack. And now where do you find Kathleen Monk? She's on the CBC all the time as an NDP spokesperson. Uh, she's a lobbyist now in Ottawa. Um, but this is what I'm dealing with. So every day you had an arm wrestling match at 10 o'clock in the morning with these people who come into broadcasting, come into the news business because they're on a mission. It's not to inform the public. It's to get as much attention as they can for their team. If you want to be a partisan, run for a partisan party. If you want to be a partisan, go out and get elected or go to work for them. Wear the badge proudly. It's part of democracy. So, but I'm don't gonna... try and infiltrate a new show. And, and so when the fat guy goes down for something he didn't do, all these people who feel I've been the roadblock on the way to socialist nirvana, all these people say, oh, let's give him a good kick while he's down. So I've got to ask the question because there's probably someone yelling at the screen right now or yelling at their car radio listening to this is, yeah, aren't you a political uh, entity as well? Because you were appointed as a conservative in 2008 to yes. the Senate. So, so when you're saying- I was a conservative the senator for about 10 minutes. <laughs> and uh, the problem is, is that- uh, I was so uh, tired of the fight every day about the NDP and about not putting on, when Stefan Dion blew his brains out, uh, all of my buddies who worked on my show, oh no, don't show that. Oh, that's so unfair. Oh, we can't show that. We showed Stanfield dropping a football in 1974, which became... Uh, uh, the reason why thing. he lost <laughs> you know the symbol of his loss absolutely why would we not put this on why would we protect someone who wants to be prime minister of canada but they they were wearing their partisan sleeve their partisanship on their sleeve so when the call came my first reaction was i don't want to sit i want to sit as an independent and the prime minister said I need you, I need to know that I can count on you. I can't have the whip running around chasing you. Are you, which way are you going to vote? And so I thought about it and thought about it and then reluctantly agreed against the advice of many friends of mine who, uh, who, who thought, you know, but I was fed up. That's the bottom line. I was you fed up with the constant fights and the backstabbing and all that shit. I am, the business was changing, and I wasn't prepared. Unlike Mansbridge, who accommodated it, I wasn't prepared to accommodate it. I am in awe of people who have been in, have been called to the Senate, who have been called to the House of Commons, because there are a few Canadians who have been able to stand in that Senate, the upper chamber, chamber, and craft policy, be that sober second thought. You are one of them. Stepping on the Senate floor for the very first time as a newly new senator, what was that feeling like for you? Well, it was pretty exciting. It was, um, I could see from having been so many years in the press gallery, 40 some years, whatever, that the Atlantic provinces were approaching their relationship with the rest of the country in a way that I didn't think benefited the Atlantic region. They were pretty combative and they were pretty stuck in their ways. And I knew that in the arc of history, eventually um, the cost of dealing with the baby boom generation uh, of which I am on the leading edge and I'm 75 would eventually come back to uh, effect can we really in the atlantic region afford four provincial governments 
with four deputy ministers of education and four deputy ministers of everything and all the associated paraphernalia. And if, we, if we're determined to maintain that, uh, jobs for the boys, then what about purchasing? And so I got together with some other maritime. In other words, let's show the rest of Canada that we are looking for ways to be efficient ourselves and that we're not constantly. One of the things I found was that uh, they don't say it to your face, but behind the scenes, and I'd hear it in my ear when we're on live broadcast, the central Canadian elite treated Atlantic provinces like poor sisters or uh, welfare cases, right? Oh, they get their hands out again. Oh, yeah, look at that whining, complaining, blah, blah, blah. We in Ontario do everything and we are the engine of growth and we, you know, and these people just come along uh, with their hands out and uh, never do anything. You know, well, uh, Harper talked about, what would he, What did he call it? The mentality of defeat or something yeah. like that. Um, and I thought, we've got to show that we're dynamic and bright and we understand the real world and that we've got to, you know, so a bunch of us advocated for this new approach. And I was able to help a number of PEI organizations in the way they framed their requests to the federal government, in the way that they uh, shaped what it was they were trying to do. So that was my main contribution was in helping them shape their message to be successful in Ottawa and to move beyond, you know, make reference. As the prime minister said in the speech from the throne, our objective is to such and such. This project we have for PEI meets exactly those concerns. We are working with you to help you achieve your goals, not we're here with our hands out, give us free money and we'll do what we want with it. And so that's what I tried to bring was a more realistic and more uh, balanced approach. But then you ran into people like Robert Giz, who was the premier and says, oh, Duffy doesn't know, what we already have a buying of pharmaceuticals. I mean, think of why do people go to Costco? Because Costco buys in volume and, why do, and therefore the price goes down. So why wouldn't the four Atlantic provinces buy paint for the highways, for the stripe lines on the highways in common? Why wouldn't we purchase computers in common? Why wouldn't we uh, do many things in common uh, to get the best savings of the tax dollar and to reduce the cost to our taxpayers, run a more efficient government, just do what a normal family does. And Giz erupted, oh, yeah, we're already doing that when it comes to pharmaceuticals. What he didn't say was over a thousand drugs in the pharmaceutical inventory, I forget what they call it, um, but it's the list of drugs that the provincial governments pay for. They only bought nine, nine aspirin and stuff like that in common with the other provinces. Nine. And then Giz goes out with this big thing about, oh, yeah, we're already there. Duffy doesn't know what he's talking about. I mean, trying to overcome that kind of institutional inertia and the refusal to look in the mirror. Remember what happened when John Cretchen in 1996 brought in his re budget reductions, a 40% cut in some federal government departments, right? I mean... Um, that's going to come again. You just can't keep printing money forever. And so my argument was that the Maritimes, uh, leave Newfoundland out if you want. They're a special case with their hydro problems and with the offshore, but just even the Maritimes. Look at how many ways we could save money and it would help everybody. We've got so many people. This winter is going to be a disaster because of the high cost of propane and heating oil and so on. And people are having a hard time now. So having an efficient government isn't the Grinch that stole Christmas. It's the Grinch that tried to give something back to the taxpayer, which is some relief from unnecessary wasteful spending. 
I think we need more money. I, I'm in favor of a guaranteed annual income, uh, particularly for senior citizens and people who, you know, what we've got now, the McDonald Royal Commission, which reported in 1984, said that in addition to free trade with the United States, we should have a GAI. And I think that if you, if you were to eliminate all of these phony baloney programs that you got to work 13 weeks here and 12 weeks there and put this together with that, and then every leap year you do something else, it's a hodgepodge. Yeah. Wipe that away and give the people who need it more money. Don't, you know, what's the point of all these various obstacles? Um, I agree. Whole anyway, so, so those are the kinds of things that I was trying to promote, but they were, would upset the apple cart and the power structure uh, back home. And so you've got premiers saying, no, I want to have, you know, all those jobs in the liquor store. Uh, the, we get to give them to the kids of our supporters. And in PEI, they've got it right down to a system where people work half a year in the liquor store and half a year they draw EI. And it's a whole regularized system, uh, which basically means the federal government's paying half the shot, uh, well, the employer with EI. But um, it, it's, you know, and nobody wants to change. So when the time came to pile on, and there were lots of people with scores to settle. So, yeah. We uh, uh, just, I'm, I'm cautious of time here. And I have two follow up, two last questions, and then we'll wrap up here if that's okay, uh, Mr. Duffy. I'm so <laughs> short winded. <laughs> but Go but ahead. I have, the one question I want to talk about is the future of the Senate. We have a prime minister, love him or hate him, that is propped up by the NDP, the Bloc Quebecois, or, well, those are the only two parties, or the Conservatives, if they believe that something is good, in a minority situation. This, we are potentially in a minority situation, again, in the next election, because we have so many parties. Does the sober second thought still need to be around? And is it still useful in 2021, 2022, in the future? Well, I don't think you can get rid of it. So that's the first thing. I hear the argument and um, most uh, democracies have a, two, have a system of checks and balances so that the leader doesn't have unfettered power. And we see that in the States, we see that in Britain and so on. And the way the constitution is built, there is no facility uh, without basically unanimous consent of the provinces to get rid of the Senate. And Quebec will never agree to uh, any reduction in its power. And therefore, uh, it's an academic exercise. The an elected Senate, I could see some merit in that, but the premiers won't want that because right now when it comes to PEI, who, who speaks for PEI? Dennis King. And Dennis King is elected by, I don't know how many, but a few thousand people in his riding. He wasn't elected by all Islanders. And so if you had an elected Senate where senators were like in the United States, elected in statewide elections, then they could say, I speak for 15 million Ontarians as opposed to 20,000 voters or 25,000 voters in the riding of Etobicoke or wherever the current premier of Ontario is from, right? So you'd have a literally a province-wide mandate. So who's then more important? The premier? Do they become like governors in the states, minor players or less important? So the premiers will never give up the power that they get by being the spokesperson for their province. And the constitution makes it virtually impossible to abolish the Senate. Uh, I think there are lots of things the Senate could do. The Supreme Court uh, could, for example, uh, tell the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court could tell the Senate, 
that the Charter of Rights should apply there. The Senate's paid out millions of dollars in the last few years in harassment settlements, but that's not been in the public eye because they deny it. And um, when the uh, Senate recently in the last year brought in a new harassment policy, uh, Senator Mary Lou McFedrin, who is an expert on this, said that this is even worse than what they had before uh, the policy. And yet nobody was interested because it's the Senate and doesn't matter. And uh, they brought this thing in. Uh, the Auditor General recommended independent oversight of senators' expenses, as they have in Britain. That was gutted so that they have a so-called independent oversight body, which is a partisan group, which has two accountants as a potential advisors uh, to look at this. But they don't have the power. And so, as Peter... Uh, Harder, who was Mr. Trudeau's appointment as the government leader in the Senate, he's not doing that anymore. But uh, when he looked at my case, he said, here's a case where a bunch of senators ganged up on a guy uh, to punish him because they didn't like him and used the rules or twisted the rules to make that possible. And that's beyond the review of the courts because the Senate has parliamentary privilege. And so Harder was saying what we need is outside accountants who look at everybody's expenses and where there's a dispute, they, they can decide whether it's within or outside the rules. The part that also doesn't get mentioned, Chris, is that in the Auditor General's 2015 report, which came out after I was charged, but before I was acquitted, they found the leadership of the Senate had themselves uh, forged mileage claims, had hired a party planner for the Greek ball in uh, Montreal, had done all of these things. The liberal leader in the Senate, Jim Cowan, had, I think it was $29,000 of trips to Toronto. He couldn't remember what they were for. Now, somebody might have reminded him that his daughter had a new, his, uh, had a new grandchild, but uh, that didn't come up. He just couldn't remember. I was there on business, but I can't remember what it was. Um, and we had guys expensing, uh, flying from Winnipeg to hockey games in Montreal. These people were never punished and they're still there in the leadership of the Senate. But uh, senators have no rights under the Charter of Rights because we're a charter-free zone and the courts have upheld that. And I hope that they change that. Um... Well, they have to do it themselves. And yeah. so far, <laughs> they're quite happy with the club, right? And as long and my problem was was that somebody in the media who didn't understand the rules or who was maybe malicious, who knows, uh, lumped me in uh, with a group of other senators. And of course, having been well known, I was the one that attracted the attention. So I've got to ask the, the, the question, and I, I wasn't going to ask this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because it seems like you're an open, honest guy. There are no, quote unquote, liberal party of Canada senators in the Senate. They are all technically independent or the progressive Senate or however you want to call it. Uh, Senate well, there's two group. groups. There's the independents and then the old liberals have kind of gone off and formed the progressives. Yes. The Cretchen liberals, the divisions in the Senate are really more around who appointed you rather than around okay. party labels. So the Cretchamp people have all gathered now in the progressive senators group. They don't like Justin Trudeau. And if you look, that's one of the untold stories that the media either don't get, don't understand, or choose not to report. But there is a little war going on. You saw in October, October, Mr. Kretschmann gave some interviews after the election on his new book in which he was critical of Justin Trudeau. Well, that's been simmering for years because when Mr. Trudeau came in and particularly when, when the two Michael situation came up in China, uh, Jean Kretschmann called him up and said, I left a message. When the prime minister has a minute, I want to talk to him. Well, the phone rings back to Mr. Gretchen's office, and it's Jerry Butts. 
the prime minister's chief of staff. What do you want to talk to the prime minister about? And Kretschmann was enraged. How dare you, whippersnapper? I'm a prime minister. He's a prime minister. We have our own thing, right? We talk to each other. Uh, I don't need you to give me permission to speak to him. Kretschmann hung up on him. And Kretschmann tells this story himself. And so you've got uh, the Kretschmann people over and over again doing things and laying traps to embarrass the Trudeau crowd. And the media either don't get it or choose not to report it. Look at the overseas tax havens. Senator Percy Down in October was in the Toronto Star with yet another big op-ed. We've got to crack down on overseas tax havens. Well, guess who one of the most famous Canadians with a tax haven uh, would be? Think about it for a second. Why is Percy Down pushing this issue? Paul Martin, Canada Steamship Lines. I was going to say, Mar I was was say Martin, but chief I was of like... staff. <laughs> Percy Down was Gretchen's chief of staff. They hate Martin for what he did to Gretchen, pushing him out the door. And they've been quietly stabbing uh, uh, the Martin people in the back. Giuliano Zaccardelli was the commissioner of the RCMP. He put out a press release saying we're investigating in 2005, I think. We're investigating Ralph Goodale, who was Martin's finance minister, over the income trusts. Why did Zaccardelli put that out? It was unprecedented because Martin had stabbed Kretsch in the back and Kretsch had appointed Zaccardelli as the commissioner of the RCMP. So it was a hit job on Martin by Zach, not, not because he wanted Harper in there, but because he wanted, had the chance to put a shaft into Martin, and he did. Yeah. Uh, Percy Down is also pushing, uh, Kretschmann, former chief of staff who's now in the Senate, is now pushing or has been pushing for several years for free bridge fare between PEI and New Brunswick. Take the tolls off. Well, why would he do that? Because it's popular, people say, oh, great, Percy, yeah, yeah, you're a man of the people. No, if you take the tolls off the bridge to New Brunswick, the federal government will stop subsidizing the ferry service in Lawrence McCauley's riding, Kings County. There's a ferry from Wood Islands to Picto, Nova Scotia that runs all in the good weather, 10, eight, nine months a year. Lawrence McCauley, is a, is a Martin Trudeau appointee. Trudeau's got a minister of veterans affairs. Yeah. So here's a chance to stab, you know, it's the liberal party's internal war and by doing something for the people. So here's Lawrence McCauley having to say, no, 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 leave the tolls on because he's trying to protect several hundred jobs in his riding. This you know, the most important question is always why? Yeah. Why is somebody doing something? It's not just happening by accident. And that's what I tell journalism students. Why is the most important question you can ask? And they won't tell you perhaps to your face, but you ask other people behind the scenes, why would he do that? Why, would, why is he pushing this issue? Why, you know, it seems out of the blue, boom, boom. No, no. And Part sometimes- Bigger play. And sometimes, just sometimes, you have to go to the lobby of a hotel in Halifax and say you have a long distance phone call from someone. That was Charlottetown, yeah. <laughs> Charlottetown, sorry. Um, yeah. We, but we anyway, so that's all. So so you were talking about the Senate. So the old Kretschmann people are all down in, and bringing new people of that, new senators are invited in if they're that part of the Liberal Party. Yeah. The ISG are liberal, but more to the NDP. Okay. And of course the NDP opposes the Senate. No, there can't be any NDP senators, but the people who Justin has appointed uh, to the Senate, including some people from Ontario who are friends of Jerry Butts and so on, uh, people who were in the, Nova, in the Ontario win government, um, they're quite left-wing and they're too left-wing 
for the Chrétien liberals, who are tend to be more pro-business and they say we want to look out for the little people, but we have to have a strong economy in order to do it. So they're not as lefty as the ISG, and then the others are the conservatives or the pure independents. And the problem with that is the way the system is set up. If you're a pure independent, you don't get on committees and you don't uh, get to travel because you have to have the approval of the whip in order to go on these parliamentary trips or travel uh, to international meetings. So those are some of the reasons why uh, at, at the end of the day, if you're not in a caucus, you are quite disadvantaged in terms of the ability to do your job. You, you, you're the last one to uh, be allowed to ask questions at a committee meeting and so on. So you're an afterthought. My last question to, to you, uh, Mike, is this. You retired earlier this year in 2021. You are now uh, sort of, uh, you, your journalism career was amazing. You had, uh, I, I, from what I can imagine, a great time in the halls of power covering it, but also being in the halls of power as a senator. What's, what does a retired senator, retired journalist from Mike Duffy Live do in a post public life scenario now? I don't know. Um, I've been helping some people with immigration problems. Uh, you continue to do casework. When I first went into the Senate, a couple of the older hands said, uh, don't do casework, that's for the House of Commons. What I discovered was that people who have problems want somebody to talk to that they feel they know. And uh, I was blessed that many Canadians felt they knew me and felt confident in telling me their troubles. And uh, I had another friend of mine uh, who was a former MLA in PEI. He said, you can't make other people's problems yours or you'll drown. But at the very least, you can do what my darling wife calls therapeutic listening. And so I remember one particular case. Uh, I mean, there's been all kinds. It, it, COVID has shown us amazing things, Chris. Uh, how many people are, have spouses or significant others in other countries? And they have a relationship that goes on for years where they meet in Acapulco and then they'll meet somewhere else uh, and do their regular jobs the rest of the year and uh, maintain, you know, with FaceTime and all this. I mean, it's quite an amazing world. And then you get COVID and people say, well, I want to come, come visit or we're not technically married, et cetera, et cetera. And so I had a very busy time. Uh, during COVID and all of that stuff, trying to help people uh, navigate through all of that. And so some of that still goes on. People still talk to me about their messaging, and I'm, I guess I'm available as a strategic communications consultant. I can't be a lobbyist, uh, but I can tell you how to lobby or who you should call and how you should shape your message. That's permitted under the Lobbying Act. So uh, that's what I'm doing. And uh, this is the first time I've ever talked about uh, uh, what, what happened to me. Uh, um, I've still got a lawsuit going against the RCMP and we'll see where that goes. Uh, uh, people seized my pay, cost me a fortune in legal fees all because of a trumped up political deal. And in normal circumstances in the real world, if you injure someone, you have to pay, you have to compensate them for their costs. And it's only because the Senate doesn't have a charter of rights and is above the law that uh, they've been able to get away with this. And so now, the question will be, why did the RCMP, I mean, it all came out at the trial. Uh, Nigel Wright, the, the key witness against me, said in the interview with the RCMP, we're asking guy to repay money he probably doesn't know. And I was confident during all of my discussions with Senator Duffy that he did not believe that anything he had done was wrong 
or that he had committed any crime, which mm -hmm. is what the judge said. So the main guy that they used to try to get me on behalf of Stephen Harper said, I had no criminal intent. Uh, so if anything was improper, it was by accident, not by design. And that he conceded to the Mounties, I didn't owe 90,000 bucks. And so my case is very simple. If you don't owe the money, it's one thing to say, for the sake of, of optics, you know, would you pay back $1,000 or something? You say, well, the political embarrassment. But $90,000, that's the price of a house. Yeah. I'm going to do this and say it was a technical error on my part when I know it wasn't and when the rules are there and Deloitte said he didn't break any rules, he didn't do anything wrong, and yet Harper had this idea, I know you didn't break the rules. Do you the hold rules ill will are... towards Stephen Harper? I feel sorry for those around Stephen Harper. Uh, I, I'll just let it go with that. Uh, do you, do you, you hold cannot? Ill? Oh, go ahead. No, I don't hate anyone, but I feel sorry for people who have no empathy, who have no uh, sense of right and wrong, and who uh, put power above all else. That's that's not. Excuse me. No worries. Um, Mike, uh, we have been chatting for an hour and a half. I said we would be about 45 minutes, but it's about an hour and a half. And I want to thank you because I, I know you have other things to do. And I want to thank you for taking 90 minutes out of your day and chatting with me. Um, I have immense respect for you uh, and your career. You helped me become the journalist I was starting out, so I want to thank you for that. I, uh, I always watched your show, and I took how you handled your guests as something I wanted to emulate. So thank you so much for showing journalists in 2000, what was it, 2003, 2004, 2005, how to do journalism correctly. So thank you. Thank you. That's a tremendous compliment. And uh, thank you. And have a great holiday season, onwards thank, and upward. Thank Health you. Health so and much. happiness. Health and happiness. Much appreciated.